tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by June's Journey. Folks, there's somebody in my life. I have to admit it. You see, for a little bit of time in the morning when I wake up, I reach over, grab my phone, and spend a few minutes with June. Now, now, it's not quite what you're thinking. You see, June's a detective and she needs help solving cases. And the thing is, you might be able to help her too in June's Journey. June's journey is set in the Roaring Twenties, and June, an amateur sleuth, is trying to solve the mystery of what really happened to her sister and her sister's husband. But take heart, because she won't be alone. She'll have you coming along with her, digging through scene after beautifully detailed scene, looking for hidden objects and discovering the clues that will help her push forward. It's exciting, brain-teasing, and, well, just if you think you've solved everything, Every week, there's a new mystery waiting for you to take a crack at. And even if you've been with June on one case or another, why not try joining a club and match with both with and against other fellow detectives? Join me and 30 million other fans to see if you have what it takes to solve the mystery. Find your inner detective. Download June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices as well as on PCs through Facebook games. <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 11, Episode 21. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. And in this, our Halloween episode of the season, we'll be focusing on a very special subject. Pumpkins! However, we're not celebrating with pies or muffins, or even those spiced lattes everyone seems to have at this time of year. No, these pumpkins don't exactly mean as well, and we shall soon be seen. Up on my mantle, I have three jack-o'-lanterns, all carved up, and lighting up the parlor with a few flickering candles, and we'll talk about each in turn. However, I must make a note that you're currently listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which means you'll only hear about two of my three little carved beauties. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the Moonlit Trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> Our first pumpkin has a very interesting carving on it. It seems to resemble three teenagers, I believe. Though I can't quite understand what it's about, 
them that's so unusual. Now this pumpkin was sent us along with a note, and what appears to be a blood-soaked pile of papers. It reads, Happy Halloween, Mr. Jiry. I hope that my jack-lantern will make more sense to you once you know the sordid tale behind it. Let's just say teenagers should find new hobbies on a night like this. Your friend, Nicholas Gray. Well, how nice. Let's see what we have here to kick off our evening, shall we? Without further ado, I present to you Smashing Pumpkins. Crisp fall leaves tumbled in the breeze through the quiet suburbs, passing three teenagers who were up to no good. Chrissy, the teen in front of the pack, was concocting something sinister. Her compadres, Richard and Marcus, followed close behind, wondering what their fearless leader was stirring up in her troublemaking mind. This sucks, Chrissy said, anger coursing through her. She kicked a rock which sailed through the air and disappeared into sidelining grass. Richard and Marcus didn't reply. They allowed her to steam with rage. The two boys were both secretly afraid of Chrissy and would never stand up to her, especially when she was frustrated like she was now. They'd just been chased away from their spot behind the dumpster by a teacher leaving the school property a little late in the day. The teacher caught them smoking cigarettes and demanded they escort themselves off the property at once. Chrissy gave her the finger and that's when the teacher said she was going to call the police. Chrissy, not one to fold the bluffs that easily, told her two friends to book it. She was chauffeured home the other day by the police after she was caught TPing the Rogers home and didn't want to deal with her father again. Her father was a man who loved discipline. He was a soldier in Afghanistan and had come back after Chrissy's mother died in a car crash. He didn't like being back in the States. Unlike some, Chrissy's father enjoyed the thrill of combat, and being away from his responsibilities at home, well, that was a plus. But after Chrissy's mother died, he was forced to return home, and he returned with malice in his heart. Chrissy's father blamed her for a lot of things. Sometimes it was deserved, other times it wasn't. Like blaming her for his miseries was not deserved. When he did gather up a reason to discipline her, he didn't let up. He had a special belt just for her that he liked to use when she misbehaved. She hated that damn belt. Now, Chrissy and her friends found themselves away from their spot with nothing better to do than mosey about. They had plenty of time in their hands before they had to go home. It was fall, so dusk was approaching soon sky darkening as the binnets ticked by. They were walking aimlessly with nothing to do. That's when they began to pass Mr. Reed's pumpkin patch. Mr. Reed was an outstanding citizen who was nice and friendly to all. You could find him tending to his pumpkin patch around this time of year. He was the cheapest with his prices when selling pumpkins. He also gave discounts to kids. Chrissy couldn't stand him or his stupid pumpkin patch. There was something about his nice demeanor that rubbed her the wrong way. She couldn't comprehend someone being nice for the sake of being nice. When someone was nice, they only wanted something in return. At least that's how Chrissy saw it. But Mr. Reed seemed to be an exception to the rule, and that infuriated her because it meant she was wrong about every nice person having a secret agenda for being nice. As Chrissy and her two friends passed Mr. Reed, who was tending this year's harvest, Chrissy locked eyes with Mr. Reed, who waved and smiled at the passing teenagers. Chrissy's two friends returned the kind gesture, but Chrissy didn't. She gave him a malevolent look that bored into the kind man. He noticed her look and gave an individual wave and smile. Realizing she was glaring, she switched up her demeanor and gave him a sardonic wave with a tight-lipped smile that had no sincerity behind it to match. Mr. Reed went back to his pumpkins as the teens walked by. I hate that man, Chrissy said under her breath. Who, Mr. Reed? Marcus asked unbelievingly, 
Nobody hates Mr. Reed. Well, I do, she seethed. That's when an idea sparked in Chrissy's mind. Guys, I have an idea what we can do tonight. Chrissy said, still maintaining her pace, as the two boys followed closely behind, like obedient dogs. The boys didn't have anything to do tonight, since they both had reached the age where they were too old to be trick-or-treating. And no one was never too old to celebrate Halloween. Unfortunately, neither of the boys were invited to any parties, and they didn't feel like passing out candy with their parents, so they were stuck doing whatever Chrissy decided they'd do tonight. Chrissy thought for a moment before speaking. After a few seconds of gears turning in her head, she said to her two followers, Put on some dark clothes and meet me back here. A devilish grin crept upon Chrissy's face. Tonight we're going to have some fun after all. Chrissy went home and got dressed in the darkest clothes she could find. She wore a plain black hoodie, her darkest pair of skinny black jeans, and slipped on the steel toe boots she'd insisted her mother buy her the previous year. She liked the gothic look the boots added to her wardrobe. She also felt powerful wearing steel toe shoes. She didn't know exactly why, but she had an idea. She thought that maybe it was the fact that if she had to cave somebody's face in, the steel toe boots would easily do the trick. They'd deal out more damage than her puny sneakers ever could. Once she was finished getting dressed, she ran past her lounging father, who didn't even question where she was going, as far as he was too invested in a television program to care, and she made her way out the door. When she arrived at Mr. Reed's pumpkin patch, she saw her two cohorts approaching, and it looked as if they'd followed her instructions pretty well. From head to toe, they wore all black like she requested. The only issue she saw was that Richard was wearing a bright blue cap. Richard, Chrissy said in a nonchalant voice, what are you wearing? Oh, this, Richard replied, gesturing to his hat. It's my lucky hat. I see, Chrissy said, slightly nodding her head. She looked at Marcus and saw him shaking his head, like he couldn't believe his friend's stupidity either. In a flash, Chrissy grabbed the hat off of Richard's head and flung it like a frisbee into the road. Hey, Richard exclaimed. He went to berate her, but she beat him to it. Are you stupid, Chrissy hissed. Do you want to get caught? Get caught, Richard asked, genuinely confused. Caught doing what? Marcus was smarter than Richard by miles. He knew Chrissy wanted them to dress all in black for reason. People who wore all black at night wanted to sneak around in the shadows where their deviant ways could go undiscovered by the public. So Marcus knew that Chrissy had ill intentions, but even he didn't know just what her devious mind was conjuring up. Marcus sometimes wondered how dumb his friend Richard really was. Today, he was feeling dumb just for being in cahoots with him. Chrissy looked at her two longtime friends and wondered if they would chicken out when she told them her plan. She knew Marcus would most likely follow her to the depths of hell because, unbeknownst to him, she knew that he had a small crush on her. And Richard, their big, thick-skulled friend, usually just followed Marcus around like a lost puppy, so he, she didn't really worry about it too much. We're going to Mr. Reed's pumpkin patch. And she thought about how she was going to word it, then decided to just blurt it out. Well, let's just say that we have some pumpkins to smash. Both of her friends' eyes went wide. You two in? she asked, starting to wonder if she had them on her side. Richard looked at Marcus and said, I'm in if Marcus is in. Marcus looked unsure. Chrissy knew she'd have to do something to sway him. Chrissy leaned into Marcus's ear and whispered, I'll kiss you on the lips if you do this for me. Marcus's face flushed, and he looked at the ground, shaking his head in disbelief. He wondered if this was for real or not. Finally, after a few seconds of thought, Marcus looked up to Chrissy and nodded his head, signaling that he was in. Good, Chrissy said nodding her head in approval. She knew she could talk these dweebs into it. She already knew that Richard was going to go wherever Marcus went. 
They were tied at the hip like Mary and her little lamb. Richard being a lamb, and Marcus being his keeper. Now let's hop this fence and start smashing. She went over the fence where she had an aluminum bat leaning against one of the boards. Whoa, Marcus said. What's that for? Easy, Chrissy said soothingly. It's for the pumpkins. Marcus relaxed, shoulders slowly falling, as he sighed with relief. He didn't want to harm anyone. He wouldn't be able to live with himself with somebody's blood in his hands. Chrissy looked one way down the street, then the other, then leapt over the rickety old fence. The two friends followed suit, and in a split second, they were in Mr. Reed's pumpkin patch. They journeyed deep into the field, keeping their heads low as they crouched, walked, over pumpkins and their stems. When they made it deep into the field, Chrissy looked both ways to see if there was a person within earshot of their soon-to-be vandalism. When she was confident no one was around, she looked at her two friends and devilishly grinned. You ready? Chrissy asked. Richard smiled, giddy at the chance to smash things. Marcus gulped nervously but shakily nodded his head. He wasn't too sure about this, but he'd risk anything for a kiss from his pretty friend, his crutch. As Chrissy raised the aluminum bat into the air, Marcus harshly whispered for her to stop. She halted her momentum and looked at Marcus, who was ducking down and pointing towards something on the horizon. A dark silhouette stood menacingly at the hilltop, glaring down at them with evil intent. Chrissy's bravado faltered for a moment. She was worried that Mr. Reed had caught them. She was already trying to conjure up a lie that would get her out of this, even if it meant throwing her two friends under the bus. Marcus gulped as he looked toward the man, standing on the hilltop. He, too, was wondering how Chrissy was going to talk her way out of this jam. Marcus did trust his fearless leader, mostly letting his heart blind him from her true intentions. She wouldn't even think twice when it came to ditching him at the first sign of trouble. But Marcus believed he would do anything for her, even if it meant taking a bullet for the girl. He truly thought it was in love. They all ducked down in the field, hoping their dark clothing would mask them in the night amongst the pumpkins. They stared at the man on the hilltop, trying not to take a breath, because their breath in the chilly night air would surely expose their position. The only thing moving on the still man was the gray cloth that covered his torso, which blew in the wind like Dracula's cape. Percy looked closer, analyzing the man, and when she identified who it was, she breathed a sigh of relief. She then turned to her friends and gave them a quick chuckle. What's so funny? Richard asked, frustrated that she'd be laughing in a situation like this. He wondered if she'd finally cracked. Marcus knew why her chuckle was turning into a gut-busting laughter. You guys are afraid of a damn scarecrow, she said between bouts of laughter. When Richard looked toward the man on the hilltop and saw that he was a scarecrow, he was incredulous. I'm not scared. I, I was just, just... This made Chrissy and Marcus guffaw. When her laughter subsided, Chrissy wiped tears from her eyes and lifted the bat to her side. Okay, who's ready to smash some pumpkins? Richard raised his hand and bounced in place, pleading that he be the first to smash a pumpkin. But Marcus interrupted his begging and insisted. Ladies first. Chrissy smiled. In a certain light, Marcus wasn't a bad-looking kid. Chrissy could see them together one day as a couple. For now, she liked the idea of keeping him at bay, allowing him to be her friend for now. She liked seeing him blush and struggle with his words when he was around her and would hate for that to come to an end. So she would keep the worm on the hook, dangling the bait over the pond where the fish eagerly awaited, but it desired to drop into its mouth. Chrissy nodded to the two boys and raised the aluminum bat over her head, ready to bring it down with a crashing blow. When the bat reached the highest point, she did just that. She brought it down with so much force that upon impact, the pumpkin, which was slightly rotted, exploded into a thousand pieces. She lifted the bat up to strike the pumpkin's nearest neighbor, 
and I had flung bits and pieces of pumpkin guts to Richard, who made a face as he slunk back and away from the splash, though. Gross! Richard yelled as Chrissy struck the next pumpkin. This pumpkin didn't explode like the first one did, it being a bigger and brighter orange gourd. The top part split open, almost splitting in half, but it held strong. Chrissy lifted the bat up once more and swung it down with all her remaining strength thinking about that teacher and her father at the same time. With hate behind her swing, Pumpkin burst open, revealing pumpkin guts galore. Breathing heavily, Chrissy took her time to catch her breath. Richard was begging for a turn with the bat, and Chrissy held it out to him. He took the bat and immediately started swinging at the pumpkins. With his strength, the pumpkins were reduced to nothing more than mush. While Richard was going at the pumpkins, not paying attention to his surroundings, Marcus went over to Chrissy, who seemed to be still out of breath. So, Marcus said nervously, uh, about that kiss. Chrissy looked at him, still breathing, in big helpings of oxygen. Her look said, really? Now? Which made Marcus reconsider his words. I mean, you don't have to if you don't want to. I know you didn't mean it, and he said, but was caught off guard when she leaned towards him and pecked him on the cheek. Marcus flushed, held his hand against his cheek, and grinned stupidly. Don't let that get to you, big head, Chrissy said. Marcus, rubbing his cheek as if to rub in the kiss so it would remain on him forever, said, I'm never washing my face again. Chrissy giggled, and Marcus continued to blush. Marcus didn't care if they were vandalizing at that particular moment. He was mesmerized by the kiss, not wanting to move. Then a scream pierced their ears, causing them to quickly turn towards Richard. Richard looked back towards them, face ghostly white, and eyes filled with fear. What the fuck was that? Richard went to say, when all of a sudden was lifted a few dozen feet into the night sky. Now Richard was screaming. He screamed obscenities. He cried to be put down. He screamed for his friends to help him. He finally screamed in agony as the thing behind him, lifting him into the air, stared down at Chrissy and Marcus. It was that scarecrow, the one at the top of the hill. It seemingly stood over eight feet tall, possibly even taller than that. It was hard to tell from their vantage point, but the Scarecrow was much taller than they originally thought. From a distance, it was nothing more than a mere silhouette, but under the pale moonlight, its features could be seen up close, and it was horrifying. The thing wasn't a Scarecrow at all, at least not in the way of looks. Its head was that of a jack-o'-lantern with orange teeth, its carved face glowing red. It glared down at Chrissy and Marcus, its torso was a rib cage, with its inner workings being pumpkin guts that pulsated like a beating heart. The jack-o'-lantern creature was lanky, and its arms and legs were long and strawny. It didn't look like it had a lot of brawn, yet it lifted Richard, who was a big 250-pound kid, into the air like he was weightless. The vine slithered up from the jack-o'-lantern creature and made its way around Richard's throat. Richard began to struggle, violently kicking and punching the air, as the creature let go and allowed the vine to continue its strangulation. Richard hung in the air as if hanging from a noose attached to the top of a lamp post. The vine around his neck strengthened its grip, tightening and tightening until the boy's neck couldn't handle it anymore. An audible crunching sound filled the autumn air as Richard's body fell limp in the air, dangling lifelessly while swaying from prior attempts to escape. Chrissy and Marcus just stood there, helplessly watching their friend suffocate to death. They were just kids, not knowing what to do in a situation like this. Never, while watching horror movies, did they see themselves in a predicament such as this, so they couldn't fathom what their next move should be, though it was clear as day that their next move should be running like hell. Chrissy, her bravado still lingering in her system, didn't quite identify that she was in trouble yet. She was scared shitless, but with the aluminum bat in hand, 
She felt like she could beat this scrawny monster to death. Marcus, on the other hand, was wanting to run like hell, but it didn't matter how many times he pulled on Chrissy's hoodie. She wouldn't budge. Chrissy stepped up to the jackal lantern creature and got into a quick batting stance. She was up at bat and planning to hit a home run. She swung at the lanky Halloween monstrosity's legs, where a kneecap should have been. A loud snap filled their ears as the jack-o'-lantern man buckled and went down to grab its leg. As it bent downward, Chrissy swung the bat at the poor excuse for a Halloween decoration pumpkin's head. When the bat collided with the pumpkin man's head, Chrissy felt a tinge of pain as the shock of the head slithered up her arms. The reverb from the head caused Chrissy to falter a bit. She staggered back, not having anticipated the creature's head would be like concrete. She was stunned. Marcus saw it all go down on the head was frozen in place, not able to make a move to help. A few options ran through his mind as he struggled to decide what to do. Marcus's choices were simple. Help battle the pumpkin-headed creature run like hell and hope to God Chrissy followed close behind. He wanted to choose the latter so badly, but he didn't want to start running and learn the thing's long legs came with speed. So really there was only one option, and it was to help Chrissy fight the creature. Chrissy was paralyzed, not thinking clearly. She saw the dent in the jack-o'-lantern in the man's head, but why it didn't explode like a normal pumpkin to kill the son of a bitch was beyond her. She honestly thought she had him, but now she was unsure, which she knew could lead to her demise. The vine sprang from the creature as it roared at Chrissy. The vine was almost to her, when Marcus leapt in front of her bat in hand and swung. The aluminum bat hit the vine, causing the creature to let out a whining noise as if hurt. The creature got up into a standing position and bolted toward the kids arms reaching out to grab them. Marcus, though scared, conjured up some bravery in front of Chrissy. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he hoped he was scoring points with her as he defended her life. When the jack o lantern man was almost within arm's reach, Marcus quickly got into batting position, swung with all his might. A clapping noise occurred then. Marcus had swung with his eyes closed. And when he opened them and tried to pull the bat away, he realized instantly how screwed he was. The beast of the pumpkin patch had caught the bat in midair. Steam began to rise out of the creature's mouth as the pumpkin guts in its ribcage pulsated with anticipation. Marcus looked to where Chrissy was, but she was no longer by his side. He looked briefly behind for her before realizing she was gone. When he looked back at the monster, he saw that it was no longer giving him any attention, but was seeking out Chrissy's path as she ran toward the fence. The jack-o'-lantern creature hissed and drew its attention back toward the screaming kid before it. Hey, Gordy! Marcus yelled at the creature. Here fights with me! Marcus tried to wrench the bat back. The thing pulled it relentlessly toward itself, drawing Marcus closer. Marcus yanked on it a second time both hands attempting to wrench it back, but it was to no avail. The creature had it and wasn't letting go anytime soon. Marcus was just about to book it, letting the bat go and turning to run for the fence as well, when the thing grabbed him. The jack-o'-lantern creature had a good hold of his ankle. Marcus kicked with his free leg, kicking the hand of the monster, and it just about worked. It screamed out in pain, letting go for a second. Marcus took a second to try and get up into running position, the thick vine wrapped around his ankle, causing him to fall back to the ground, where he landed on a pumpkin that smashed from underneath him. The wind was knocked out of Marcus, and all he could do was attempt to gasp for air. His lungs couldn't get a plentiful amount of oxygen. The jack-o'-lantern creature saw that the pumpkin underneath Marcus had been squashed, and it shrieked with what seemed like grief mixed with hatred. The inside of its carved face was oddly glowing blue. When the burning sensation in his chest ended, and he was able to breathe in raspy breaths, he turned to look at the monster behind him, and 
and was shocked to see it holding its head, glaring at his shirt as if in agony. Marcus looked down and saw the pumpkin inside, covering him. Something clicked in his mind. It couldn't stand it when pumpkins were smashed. Marcus didn't know why this was or how he'd be able to use it to his advantage. He had a way of making the pumpkin beast feel pain. And by God, was he going to make the thing wish it was never born? The creature's hands were still on its head, shrieking with grief as it looked down at Marcus. Marcus noticed that the bat was lying on the ground beside the monster, and he went for it. The monster was too busy grieving over the lost pumpkin to realize what was happening. Marcus slid like a runner, stealing second base, and grabbed for the bat. The creature was caught off guard, and by the time it realized what was going on, it was far too late. The boy jumped to his feet and swung the bat, which connected with the creature's skin. The jack-o'-lantern creature doubled over, and by doing so, it left itself exposed for another hit. Remembering the reaction Chrissy had when striking the creature in the head, he decided to redirect his next swing. Instead of aiming for the head, he landed a devastating blow to the monstrosity's ribcage. A loud crack reverberated through the air as the pumpkin patch monster fell onto its back, reeling in pain. The creature was hugging itself, trying to protect its inside, but its fragile arms would be no match for Marcus's strikes. Marcus left the bat up in the air and prepared for another devastating blow. The creature's face turned from an evil carved face to one of fright. Marcus hesitated for a second, then shook away the thought of sparing the creature. The bastard killed Richard, Marcus thought. It had to die. With the decision made, Marcus brought down the aluminum bat and started breaking the jack-o'-lantern creature's twiggy arms and brittle ribcage. Pumpkin guts flew into the air and scattered around the brutal beating and splattering Marcus's face, but Marcus was undeterred. Marcus finally halted to take in a lungful of air. He looked down at the creature and saw his doing. When he was beating the thing to a pulp, he was seeing only red. Now he saw the creature in a new light. It looked fragile and was completely battered. It wouldn't be getting up and hurting anyone else, ever again. That's when he heard a scream over his shoulder. The scream that carried with it his name. It was Chrissy, crying out for his help. He didn't understand, though. Didn't he already kill the threat? Was the day not saved? Wasn't this hell over and done with? Finished? He slowly turned and immediately wished for the bliss of ignorance. He wished he didn't see what he saw then. But his eyes weren't deceiving him. It was real. What was now standing before Marcus is what seemed to be too many jack-o'-lantern creatures to count. He tried to make an estimate, maybe 30, 40 possibly, but the number was unknown. In front of the pack was a jack-o'-lantern creature that was taller than the one he just took down. In fact, most of the jack-o'-lantern creatures were taller than the one he took down. And this specific creature's embrace was Chrissy, whose eyes were watering Tear tracks running down her face. She was scared out of her mind. It looked like Chrissy didn't escape after all. The gaunt, gourd-headed creatures looked down at the mess of their companion and then looked up to meet Marcus's eyes. They were royally mad, and they had their sights on Marcus. Marcus dropped the bat and just stared in utter despair at the situation unfolding in front of him. He stood a chance against the much smaller of the creatures, but against an army of taller and possibly stronger creatures? He went to plead for his life in Chrissy's, but the jack-o'-lantern creatures approached him slowly, their intent obvious by their carved facial features. The inside of the carved pumpkin head faces illuminated with bright reds and oranges. Some of the creatures' carved faces were glowing with a color blue, and their faces seemed to be the faces of anguish as they looked down at their fallen companion. When the creatures were feet away, Marcus shielded himself with his arms, which also worked to block his vision from the frightful things. 
There was no hiding from what these creatures were going to do to him. When they collapsed on him, they made him feel every bit of torment. His bones twisted and snapped until his body was all bent out of shape. Marcus felt them tear his limbs free from his body, causing spurts of blood to cover the orange pumpkins that surrounded him. Every bit of torture that he endured was also done to his crush, Chrissy, who cried out in pain with Marcus. But their pleas for help fell on deaf ears. Mr. Reed was at his farmhouse, preparing a big bowl of candy for the trick-or-treaters who would show up the next day. He loved this time of year. It was a special time for him. He waited all year for this moment. He enjoyed almost everything about the holiday. He sold so many pumpkins this time of year, and he also enjoyed taking the kiddies on hayrides. He loved seeing the cute trick-or-treaters in their get-ups, going door to door asking for treats. He loved being a part of the celebration and loved this little town so much. Yes, he loved almost everything about Halloween. Mr. Reed had been a lonely man for quite some time now. His wife passed away young, around the time they were thinking about having children. And he was too attached to her to get back in the saddle and find another love. He just couldn't imagine himself and someone other than his sweet Eleanor. A knock on the door startled Mr. Reed almost causing him to drop the large bowl of candy. He hoped it wasn't some troublemaker here to disturb his peace and quiet. His troublemakers will be the end of me, he thought. When he opened the door, he saw nobody in sight. His first assumption was a ding-dong ditcher. But they would have a long path to run, since his house was in the middle of his field, far out from the road, so he highly doubted that if this was the case but he also wouldn't put it past one of these teenagers. The second guess was far darker, and he hoped it wasn't the latter, because if it was, that meant he had some digging to do. He begrudgingly looked down at the welcome mat on his porch, and to his dismay, he would have some digging to do tonight. On his welcome mat were the heads of three teenagers he knew were going to cause him some trouble this hell. He was hoping they would do typical delinquent things, such as TP his house or egg it. It was much easier than having to dig holes in his pumpkin patch and bury bodies. Mr. Reed set the bowl of candy down on the small table he had next to his door and went to go grab his shovel. He did love everything about Halloween. Well, almost everything. I hope you enjoyed Smashing Pumpkins by Nicholas Gray, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash nicholas gray. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash n-i-c-h-o-l-a-s dash g-r-a-y. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by June's Journey. In the evening, at the end of a long day, I'm sure there are those of you who like to wind down and think about things other than the daily grind. Maybe work on a puzzle, pick up a new hobby, or settle in on something that'll make you think a little. Now, sometimes, when I'm in the mood to keep my mind in tip-top shape and find new ways to keep the ghoulies and ghosties at bay, I like to settle in with a few rounds of June's Journey. Yes, nothing takes the edge off like diving into a good mystery. And June's Journey does not disappoint. Follow along with June through her perilous adventures on Orchid Island in the Roaring Twenties and see if you can dig through the beautifully presented scenes, finding hidden objects and locating the clues that'll help her solve the mysteries that seem to follow her wherever she goes. Or, if a new mystery a week isn't enough to keep your mind at bay, join up through one of the many detective clubs and engage in leagues testing your wits against other detectives around the world. Or, if you want to find a way to reward yourself for all the puzzle solving, take a moment to relax and enjoy making your own little 1920s paradise on Orchid Island. 
or explore the memoir mode to find out a little more about June herself. As we dip into fall, nights get longer and the cold gets deeper, it's a great way to settle in nice and cozy and while away the time. Join me and 30 million other fans to see if you have what it takes to solve the mystery. Find your inner detective. Download June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PCs through Facebook games. The preceding tale is actually part of his Halloween Tales collection, which is available for purchase on Amazon. Of course, this isn't the only set of stories by him, and you can find more short and shivery pleasures in other anthologies. If you do decide to stop by his profile, please give him a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that me, Otis Jarvis, sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Ah, now, I see what the issue was. Without the context, their heads floating in the air just seemed strange. But realizing the pool of blood is underneath them and they're screaming in terror, it all makes more sense now. Our second pumpkin seems fairly straightforward compared to our previous one. Just a simple carved face, a pleasant smile jagged teeth and angry eyes. It's just like every... Hold on. Was that on that side of the mantle earlier? I could have sworn it was. Oh, there's another note. One moment. Dear Otis, you remember what happened last year? I'm sure it will come to you in time. Signed, The Vesper's Bell. Oh, wait, wait, yes, yes. I do remember. You'd think something like that would be hard to forget. Come, gather round, closer, closer, closer. And yes, I do mean you. There was a town, a town that never asked for any trouble and got it all the same. And the visitors that just started, well, showing up. Without further ado, I present to you the Jack-o'-lantern men of Willow Wood Hill. I live in a picturesque little housing development overlooking the Avalon River, just a short drive from Somber Moray. It's surrounded by enough woods to muffle out the sound of traffic on the adjacent highway, and the road leading into the neighborhood is so discreet that delivery drivers regularly have trouble finding it. It's always felt safe to me, secluded, an isolated little bubble that the rest of the world seemingly couldn't find even if they wanted to. But that changed on October 1st. It was a gorgeous, crisp fall day. The leaves and the giant maples and oaks that surrounded our neighborhood were just starting to change colors, and I'd gone out to get my mail from our pair of community mailboxes, the newer ones with the wind-blown maple leaves blazed on the side. As I stepped out, however, I noticed that there was a small impromptu gathering of my neighbors on Mr. Kakowski's front lawn, fawning over something I couldn't quite make out. Whatever the commotion was about, I figured it was probably worth delaying getting my junk mail for a few minutes, so I casually walked over to inspect the spectacle for myself. When my neighbors saw me approaching, they politely moved aside so that I could get a clear view of whatever it was that had them so enamored. It was a jack-o'-lantern a snowman made out of jack o lanterns There were three hollowed-up pumpkins stacked on top of each other and together stood about five feet high. The top pumpkin had been carved with a fairly stereotypical jack-o'-lantern face, but the bottom two had been carved so that it looked like the figure was dressed in a brocade 19th century suit. Is that real? I asked incredulously. While it was, obviously, completely possible for it to be real, it seemed far more likely that it was some sort of mass-produced plastic Halloween decoration. It's absolutely real, Mr. Lacombe, the preteen girl, Laurel and Isley, assured me excitedly, her eyes shining like it was 
Christmas morning. She stuck her finger inside the jack-o'-lantern's mouth, ran it along the inside, and pulled it out to reveal still fresh seeds and bulb. See? I stepped closer and tentatively poked the fleshy fruit of each of the three pumpkins. They looked real, felt real, smelt real. And thus, I could only conclude that they were in fact real. These are remarkably intricate carvings, I muttered, as I ran my hand along the middle pumpkin. I glanced up towards the elderly, Mr. Kukowski, who looked like it was taking everything he had not to yell at us to get off his damn lawn. You didn't make this, did you? What do you think, he asked, holding up his clearly arthritic hands. No, the damn thing was here when the sun came up. Someone must have dropped it off in the night. Very peculiar. My gut reaction was that it was a prank of some kind, but the thing's too beautiful for that to make any kind of sense. And no one else saw anything, I asked, turning around to face the rest of the neighbors, all of whom shook their heads. I'll look over my security footage later, but I don't think uh, it'll have a very clear view of Kikowski's place at night. Heidi, Lorelan's mom, offered as she used a wet one to clean Lorelan's hands. I'll send out some emails and put a notice on the bulletin board asking about it, but I'm sure it's just a surprise Halloween decoration. And if it is, it was poorly thought out. This thing will be a pile of mush by Halloween, Kukowski said with a shake of his head, giving the pile of pumpkins a disdainful whack with his cane before turning to go back inside his house. You damn well better find who's responsible for this before then, because I'm not cleaning it up. Wait, Mr. Kukowski, I want to get a picture with the jack-o'-lantern man while we're all out here together. Laurelin pleaded, excitedly waving her phone in the air. Kukowski stopped in his tracks, hung his head, and let out a theatrically reluctant sigh before turning around and joining the rest of us for a group photo. Laurelin posted the picture she took of the jack o lantern man on her Instagram, and I decided to run a reverse image search to see if I could gain any insight about who made it. The results were unexpected. I thought I'd get results for a local craftsperson or something, but instead the algorithm matched it with a picture of HerwickHollows.net, a local paranormal discussion forum picture was a black-and-white illustration from an old newspaper article, maybe as far back as the 19th century, depicting a much more monstrous and ferocious-looking jack-o'-lantern man. According to the poster, the jack-o'-lantern man started inexplicably appearing in a nearby, though suspiciously nameless, hamlet on October 1st. There were exactly 30 homes in the hamlet, and each day until Halloween, a new jack-o'-lantern man would arrive in the wee hours of the morning, with no one ever seeing where it had come from. That detail unsettled me a little, since our housing development also had exactly 30 homes. Anyway, all manner of misfortunes started to befall the sleepy hamlet, and the increasingly paranoid villagers blamed the orange interlopers. They tried destroying or moving them, of course, but each morning they'd be back like nothing had ever happened. Some of the villagers, children at first, but later some adults, claimed to have seen the jack-o'-lantern men moving around at night, wreaking as much havoc and destruction as they could without getting caught. Naturally, the villagers' hysteria grew stronger the closer it got to Halloween, fearing some sort of inevitable climax on the 31st. Some fled, of course, and some stayed, but ultimately it didn't matter. None of them were ever heard from again. There were no physical remains, no signs of violence or bloodshed. They were just gone. The rest of the forum thread was just increasingly bizarre and baseless speculation about the nature and veracity of the event, and it quickly became silly enough to put my mind at ease regarding any similarity to my current situation. I didn't give it any more thought until I came home from work that night and saw that the jack o lantern had been lit up it struck me as odd, given Mr. Kukowski's seeming exasperation with the thing, that maybe one of the neighbors had lit it up instead. The next morning, when the sound of Laurelin's joyful, 
Excited cries came in through my open windows. I tried to deny that they filled me with an ominous sense of dread. Cautiously stepped out of my door. And sure enough, there was another jack-o'-lantern man in our neighborhood. It was right next door to Kukowski's house, the Craner's place, number two, Willowwood Crescent. It wasn't identical to the previous one, either. Clearly made from three real, once-living pumpkins, with their own distinct design carved into them. I don't suppose anyone saw where this one came from, did they? I asked without much hope as I approached the crowd of onlookers, its size surpassing the one from the day before. No one, which is pretty damn weird when you think about it, Jeremiah Craner remarked, more confused than concerned by the jack o man's presence. This thing's not exactly light. There are no marks on the lawn from someone dragging it, like it just popped out of the ground where it is. Do you think they're magic? Laurelin asked, jumping up and down. They're mysterious, Laura. Let's leave it at that for now. Jeremiah replied non-committedly, not wanting to crush her exuberance. I'm going to ask my Aunt Samantha to come look at these. She's a witch, so she'll know if they're magic, Laurelin proclaimed. Sweetheart, we've been over this. Your Aunt Samantha is not a real witch. Laurelin's mother reprimanded her gently. She was just lonely, got taken in by a New Age cultist, and now works for her as a brainwashed fake psychic. Laurelin rolled her eyes at her mother's rationalism, but didn't argue with her. Hey, Kikowski's stack of lanterns been moved, I heard Tyler Yablikov shout. They all turned to where he was pointing, and sure enough, the jack-o'-lantern man was now right up against Kukowski's front window, peering inside. There were no signs of it being hauled across the lawn. Not one blade of grass was out of shape, and yet there it was, as though it was as portable as an inflatable Halloween decoration. Laurelin excitedly ran over to the jack-o'-lantern and began knocking on Mr. Kukowski's window, only to scream when she saw what was inside. Her mother and several others immediately ran over to see what was wrong, and as Heidi comforted her daughter, the others either called for an ambulance or tried to break their way into the house. Kikowski had suffered a massive heart attack and was lying dead on his living room floor when Laurelin found him. The EMTs estimated his time of death as just after sunrise. The prevailing theory among the neighborhood was that the sight of the jack lantern men at his window had been what triggered the heart attack, and most of us wanted to know who was responsible for it. No one wanted to fess up, and I decided to keep the urban legend I'd read about to myself, so no one really had anything to go on. But even without knowing about the legend from Harrowick Hollows, a lot of people suspected that another jack-o'-lantern man would be gracing our neighborhood come October 3rd. Everyone who had anything that could be used as a security camera made sure they were set up and activated and pointed toward house number three, if it was possible. We also coordinated a watch around our work and sleep schedules as much as we could, ensuring we had the best chance of catching whoever was responsible for these things in the act. That night, as I kept my vigil on my porch, I saw the lights in both jack-o'-lantern men spring to life, even though I knew nobody would have dared to light them now. Come October 3rd, there was a grand total of three jack-o'-lantern men, and the first two, while still on their original properties, had moved as well. None of our cameras had caught their movement, and by now we were all starting to get seriously unsettled. Craner, most of all. If these things were here to pick us off one by one, then it made sense that he'd be next. Tyler was the first one to try to get rid of the damn things, and called some of his friends to help him load them up on his pickup truck. I don't remember where he planned on taking them, or what was going to be done with them, because it didn't matter. Before he could even get out of the neighborhood, one of his back tires exploded. He lost control and crashed into a street lamp. Nobody died that day, and Tyler himself was fine, aside from some whiplash. But that's when most of us became convinced that these things were cursed. Each day, a new jack-o'-lantern man would appear at the next house, and the ones who were already present would have changed positions, 
all without being seen or recorded. They didn't decay as the days ticked by either, always appearing as if they had been freshly carved. Dogs hated them, but they were probably just picking up on their owner's unease. Nobody wanted to try moving them, not after what happened to Tyler. There were no more heart attacks or car crashes after that, but the threat that jack-o'-lantern men posed still loomed over all of us. Each morning we'd regularly find things broken or missing, the jack-o'-lantern men seemingly to blame. They had a tendency to block off driveways, doorways, and garages, or sit in flower beds or play equipment. It was almost as if they were daring us to move them, but we just worked around them rather than risk it. We didn't talk about them much after the first couple of days, and never within sight or earshot of them. We'd come to a general consensus that they were trying to troll us, to egg us into somehow disrespecting them, to give them license for revenge. It was around the middle of the month when Laurelin came knocking at my door. When I answered her, I found her standing next to a woman with long red hair clad in long red dress and cloak with a pentagram necklace and a triple moon belt buckle on prominent display. Ah, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Guess that you're her Aunt Samantha, I presumed. Yes, that's right. I'm Samantha Summoner. I'm a metaphysical counselor and spiritual wellness advisor at Eve Arden's of Esoterica in town. She spoke confidently, as if those were actually verifiable and valuable credentials. It wasn't hard to see why Laurelin's mother had described her as a brainwashed fake psychic. Laurelin asked me to stop by and take a look at the jack lantern entities that have been manifesting in your neighborhood. Yeah, they've just been popping up one after another all month. No one wants to just come out and say it's supernatural. But it's pretty damn weird we've never been able to see who's doing this. I admitted, awkwardly rubbing the back of my neck. Well, I can confirm for you that all of these jack-o'-lantern entities are definitely paranormal, she said with confidence. I've been owning my clairvoyance for the past three years now, and there's no doubt in my mind that these jack-o'-lanterns are serving as earthly bindings for some manner of non-human spirits. Bindings are strong enough that they can at least manifest some minor misfortunes, and I suspect that at night, when no one else is watching them, they might be able to manipulate the jack-o'-lanterns directly. I see, I nodded, humoring her at first, but unable to deny the fact that I had no rational explanation for how they were moving or getting fresh candles. Well, do you have any idea why this is happening? Unfortunately, no. I've found records of at least one similar event over a century ago, but I wasn't able to find any clear cause for that either, she admitted. What I do know is that these kinds of spirits demand respect. Don't try to move or damage them, or they'll have no cause to retaliate. You can also buy some goodwill with a token sacrifice, like a coin or a piece of candy. Aunt Samantha and I have already fed Halloween candy to each of the jack-o'-lanterns that are already here, and I'll feed my any new ones to try to keep them from hurting anyone else, Laurelin said doggedly. She was clearly still shaken by Kikowski's death. Hell, I was too. And it was kind of heartwarming to see how determined she was to keep the rest of us safe. I smiled warmly at her while her aunt gave her a consoling pat on the back. Is there anything I can do? I asked. Just avoid disrespecting the jack-o'-lanterns, and when yours appears, be sure to honor it with a small sacrifice of some kind, Samantha replied. For good measure, can make a sacrifice to the rest of them as well. Avoid them at night as much as you can. They're stronger when the veil between the physical and the spiritual planes is weaker, and it's weaker at night, and it'll be weakest of all on Halloween. I don't know what's going to happen on Halloween, but if you can avoid offending them, I think you should be okay. If you like, I can perform a blessing on your home that should make it a little harder without any malicious spirits to harm you. No charge. With a reluctant sigh, I let the potentially crazy woman into my house. She did a little ritual and left me with her business card in case I wanted to invest in any of the protective charms that they sold as well. That did make me start to wonder 
if the whole thing might have been some elaborate guerrilla marketing campaign. But I couldn't deny that Samantha did seem sincere in her convictions. I watched through my window as she and Laurelyn went over to Tyler's house, only to be shooed away like Jehovah was witnesses. He was still pissed with the jack o lantern men over his truck and neck, and I knew he wasn't going to follow their advice. Somehow, that gave me a very uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. The next day, I and probably everyone else in the neighborhood were woken up by the sounds of Tyler's cursing. He'd gotten his jack-o'-lantern man, and it had appeared on the roof of his truck. It seems they had finally crossed a line that one of us couldn't abide by, and I watched helplessly as an enraged Tyler climbed up into the back of his pickup truck and furiously shoved the jack-o'-lantern man onto the asphalt below. The pumpkins cracked but largely remained intact, which Tyler apparently thought was a fate too good for them. He grabbed what I think was a monkey wrench from the toolbox in his truck and just started pulverizing the thing, stopping its hide until it was mush. He was so engrossed in his vengeance that he didn't notice when the parking brake to his truck suddenly gave out and started rolling down his inclined driveway. I watched as it swerved, seemingly without cause, and crashed into an electric pole. I'm not a physicist. There's no way that truck was moving with enough kinetic energy to topple that pole, and yet, somehow, that's exactly what happened. I heard it snap like a tree from a bolt of lightning and saw it fall forward onto Tyler's house. Taut power lines snapped, flailed about wildly, and started a fire that would burn Tyler's house to the ground. Even in broad daylight, the smoke and flames from the inferno could be seen for miles. Tyler was devastated, of course, but more than that, he was terrified. A lot of us were terrified. We had no reason to think that burning down Tyler's house would be enough to sate the jack-o'-lantern's need for revenge. For all we knew, Tyler was a dead man, and we might all be next. The day after the house fire, Tyler's jack-o'-lantern man was back in one piece again, holding a marshmallow on a stick over the still smoldering rubble. A lot of us decided to leave the neighborhood after that, at least until after Halloween, but not me. I honestly didn't think running away would do any good, and if anything, I'd just be putting innocent bystanders in danger. I stayed, placing the spare change into the mouths of each and every jack-o'-lantern man, exactly as Samantha had said. Today, October 30th, the last jack-o'-lantern man appeared, and it appeared on my lawn. I'm at house number 30, you see, right across the street from Kakowski's house, since it's a crescent and all. I slowly pulled back my curtains, knowing it would be there, but dreading the confirmation nonetheless. It was the worst one so far. It was bigger, too, bigger than I was in both height and girth. Its face was a monstrous, sneering gargoyle, or maybe more like a Japanese onai. Its bottom, two bumpkins, weren't carved to resemble an outfit, but rather medieval depictions of hell, embellished by the candle glowing inside it. I noticed then that not only it, but all the other jack lantern men had their candles lit in the daytime, and they were burning brighter than they ever had before. Knowing what I had to do, I steeled up my courage and went outside, a bowl of Halloween candy in hand. I fed my jack-o'-lantern man first, then went door to door to feed the rest of them. Laurelin's family was among those that left, and I promised her I'd keep making offerings to the jack-o'-lantern man. I've fortified my house a little, but what happened at Tyler's place is proof that I won't stop them. I can only hope that we've managed to appease them. They're all here now, all thirty of them. They've got one night left to do whatever it is they're going to do. Tomorrow won't be children, but the jack lanterns doing the trick-or-treating. And I can only hope that our treats will be enough to stave off their tricks. I hope you enjoyed the jack-o'-lantern men of Willowwood Hill by the Vespers Bell. 
as performed by yours truly. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by Generation Y, a podcast by Wondery. Now, listeners, we're all friends here, and I know Scary Stories Told in the Dark isn't the only podcast you listen to. And with so many wonderful ones available right now, I can't say I blame you. However, if I may make a suggestion, I think I found one that we will all enjoy. For true fans of true crime, the Generation Y podcast is essential listening. Hosts Aaron and Justin started this podcast in 2012 to dissect some of the craziest and most notable murders, crimes, and conspiracy theories together. Ten years later, they're still at it, unraveling a new case each week. Aaron and Justin take on infamous cases like the evil genius bank robbery, the Zodiac Killer, and the Tylenol murders. Follow the Generation Y podcast on Amazon Music or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus on Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more of tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash the Vespers Bell. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash T-H-E dash V-E-S-P-E-R-S dash B-E-L-L. The Heroic Chronicles series continues with a third volume, Liminal Labyrinths, due out soon. You can also catch his sci-fi work with Madness is Like Gravity, whose protagonists have shown up in tales on this program in the past. Finally, you can locate him on Reddit, where you can see his work appear on the subreddits Odd Directions and the Cryptic Compendium, beyond his own postings. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured authors. As a reminder, if you do decide to give tonight's talented authors stories a read, please consider leaving them a quality review and a kind word, or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. And be sure to let them know you heard about them here on this program, and that me, Otis, sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure that would be much appreciated by everyone. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can also subscribe to me on YouTube at the Otis Jari channel where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. What else? Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. 
You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>